All right. Thanks, guys. It is really good to be here. Wow, you guys are a really big group here. I uh, hope you're excited. Who, who here is registered for cross-training, a fall conference? Who's going there? All right. Okay. Who here is participating in the Crossroads track at cross-training? Anybody? Got a couple. Okay. That was, that was a little weaker. Um, <coughs> Woo! All right, you got you got my you got my cheer. All right, so uh, I will be staffing the Crossroads track at Cross Training with uh, Casey Ellers, an alumnus of your chapter over here. So hope you guys are excited for that. I'm really excited. I love uh, I love Crossroads. I love evangelism. I love being around uh, believers and non-believers, and especially those who are seeking uh, to grow closer to Jesus. Those who don't yet know Jesus or don't yet follow Jesus. Uh, it's yeah, I mean, I love it so much that I get paid to do it now, right? So uh, it's a lot of fun. A uh, little bit about myself, if we, as, uh, ha, 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 All right, uh, we can go to a picture over here. Okay, uh, so this is, this is my chapter. This is uh, Asian American University at the UW-Madison. This is two years ago at Cross Training, our fall conference, right? So the first day, people show up wearing kind of school gear. You guys have your, do you guys do your yellow bandanas on the first at Cross Training? Oh, whoops. Orange. Oh, my orange. I'm I'm a little colorblind, so you know, I don't I don't see color, right? Okay, anyway. Um so uh so this is this is our chapter over here. We had a we had a bet. Our leadership team had a bet with our chapter that if more than fifty people showed up, uh, if more than fifty people showed up that that all the leaders of the chapter would show up in costume. Uh, that all the leaders would show up in costume. All right, so if you look at the bottom left, uh, bottom row, uh, left, third from the left, uh, you see a Pikachu. You see a Pikachu, right? Uh, let's see, back row, third from the left, uh, I believe that is a kangaroo. Uh, that is a kangaroo. Uh, second from the right in the back row is a penguin. Uh, is a penguin. Uh, I think there's Santa Claus somewhere in there. It's a little harder to see because of the red. Uh, there should be one more costume in there. Um, hmm. That first, somebody, oh. Where, who, what, oh, Santa? Yeah, I, I think there's actually one more costume in there somewhere too, but anyway, uh, unfortunately this year, this year we did not meet our, our bet goal, uh, with our chapter. Uh, if you see the big bunch of Asians at cross training, that's us, but, um, uh, yeah, we did not achieve our goal, so there won't be ridiculous-looking people in costumes, unfortunately. That'll that'll happen tomorrow, uh, but um <coughs> uh, but not at cross training, not at cross training. So anyway, a little bit about myself. So I, I staff, I serve as full-time advisor uh, for Asian American University, the UW Madison. I've been doing that for been doing that for eight years now. I'm uh, kind of a veteran. But uh, also, I serve as regional multi-ethnic specialist. I coach a lot of different chapters in terms of reaching uh, a more diverse and especially more ethnically diverse crowd uh, for their chapters and really sharing the gospel with all corners uh, of their campus. Yes, there is diversity on your campus somewhere, I promise you. All right, so <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I, or so I've heard, or so I've heard. So anyway, uh, so that's, that's my chapter. As I've said, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I'm Taiwanese American. Uh, my parents immigrated to the U.S. from Taiwan. Um, I grew up on the south side of Chicago in the Hyde Park neighborhood, uh, and kind of somehow found myself in Wisconsin. Oh, I actually uh, I majored in music performance. Is there is there a music program at Platteville? Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. I th I thought you guys were all like techie types. You know, that's that's what I've heard. So, anyway, so I majored in music performance. Uh, I attended the University of Illinois, whose colors are orange and blue as well. You guys have good taste. So, <coughs> uh, yeah, that's that's uh, uh, a little bit about me and kind of uh, what I hope to do. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, folks in here uh, who do crossroads at cross training, I'll have a chance to get to know you a little bit better. Also, uh, I think a group of here, a group of folks here, did Mark study at Chapter Focus Week a couple years ago. Yeah, and uh, and I was there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, so I was there with you guys. So um, yeah, I love working with Platteville students. I didn't actually know kind of how close you guys were to Madison. It really wasn't that far of a drive. It's kind of it was, it was like, oh, I'm here. Okay. So uh, anyway, so it's good to be here. A uh, little bit of a, a recap. Uh, you guys are going through the Book of Acts, uh, right? And uh, apparently that's what I'm supposed to speak on. I, I hope. Is that, is that right? Okay. So I'm supposed to speak on, the, speak on the book of Acts, but what we're doing here is we're actually skipping four chapters. 
Uh, these are four good chapters, but fear not, fear not. I will, I will catch you up uh, on what happened in these four chapters. But uh, so uh, Acts chapter one, right? Jesus, Jesus ascends to heaven, and as he ascends, he tells his disciples uh, that they will be his witnesses in Ju- in Jerusalem and Judea, right? All of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then he goes up, up, and then. Uh, and then we have the Pentecost, right? Uh, the Holy Spirit descends like tongues of fire onto the disciples. There are ethnic Jews uh, from throughout the region uh, who speak a bunch of different languages as their native tongue because they grew up in those environment, in those environments. But they're back and they hear the gospel in their own language, right? They hear the gospel in their own language, and then they go up to the disciples and like, "Oh, you speak my language." And then you know the disciples are like. I don't understand what you're saying, right? Because they were given the ability to speak these different languages and preach, but not like they actually gained full fluency in those languages. So they heard the gospel, and then the disciples, uh, the church grows, right? The word of God spreads, and uh, the early church has all things in common, has all things in common. Um, And then you guys kind of got up to chapter four uh, here in your large group meetings here. Uh, So just a quick recap, I'm just going to give you uh, just kind of a quick rundown of what happened in chapters five through eight. Okay, so chapter five actually kind of isn't that important except for foreshadowing purposes. Uh, So Ananias and Gamaliel, uh, we see them both there. The reason these two characters are there is foreshadowing, okay, Uh, because this guy named Saul will will persecute Christians and become Paul. So they're mentioned here because they're part of the story. And actually a couple times in there, uh, the author Luke mentions and Saul saw the church grow and was angry or something, right? So, so they're foreshadowing Saul because, sorry, spoiler alerts, he's, he's going to become a Christian and come to faith. Um, I totally just stole the thunder of whoever's, <laughs> whoever's speaking, like, next week and the week after. So, y- I mean, yeah. So, all right, so that's, that's chapter 5. Uh, now, hold on, chapter 6. So this is important to today. All right, I just spoiled, like, future large group speakers, but chapter 6 is important to what happens today. So in chapter 6, we see in the early church in Jerusalem, uh, they're kind of two really kind of language ethnic groups, uh, so to speak. Now, everybody's really ethnically Jewish and religiously Jewish at this time, uh, but they begin following Jesus. Uh, but there are two language groups. We have uh, the Hebraic Jews who speak Hebrew as kind of their native, or Aramaic as their native tongue. Uh, so they're native speakers of that. Uh, and there are the Hellenistic or the Greek Jews uh, who speak Greek as their native tongue. Mostly this is because they often grew up uh, outside of Jerusalem or other places where kind of Greek is the main language. Uh, Greek in that day was much like English is today, uh, kind of a global language used for business and commerce, so to speak. So uh, there was conflict between the Hebraic Jews and the Hellenistic Jews at this time. Uh, especially in terms of the distribution of food, again, because the early church had all things in common, uh, those who uh, were Greek-speaking were being overlooked, right? There was a group of people that were being overlooked. Obviously, part of that was, pro- was probably a language barrier, right? But they're, they're deeply upset. They're being overlooked. Uh, and uh, what happens is the 12 disciples, all of whom are Hebraic Jews, all, all the 12 disciples are Hebraic Jews, all right? So they appoint seven deacons. Uh, these are the first deacons in the early church, um, actually all of whom happen to be native Greek speakers. Okay, so all of the first seven deacons are native Greek speakers. They appoint them to leadership positions uh, in the early church, in the early church, and actually this kind of resolves the conflict. Everybody's super happy, and actually uh, the onlookers are so impressed that more people come to faith. More people come to faith. In fact, uh, Acts 6 says actually priests uh, who you would think would be skeptical, right, because uh, those who do religious stuff for a living uh, tend to uh, think that they or we know what we're talking about. Um, so a great number of, of priests actually even start following Jesus because they're so impressed. Uh, they're so impressed at how these disciples uh, handle that situation. All right, uh, so that's chapter 6. Uh, included, in, included in those first seven deacons are two really important deacons uh, for you to know of. One is Stephen. One is Stephen, and the second is Philip. Philip, who is our main character today. Okay, so that's kind of the background. Uh, These are the first deacons appointed in the early church, native Greek speakers, but ethnically Jewish, uh, appointed into leadership positions in the church. All right, in Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, 
uh, Stephen is martyred. <laughs> Oops. So Stephen dies. You know, <laughs> he's mentioned a chapter earlier. A chapter later, he dies. I mean, the author of Acts is like the Game of Thrones guy. Okay, so Stephen's dead. All right. So, <laughs> um, so Stephen's dead. Uh, you know, he got you to like him. It's like this guy, this Stephen guy is so great. And then a chapter later, he dies. All right, uh, for his faith, he dies for his faith. Uh, and that that actually brings us to chapter eight. That brings us to chapter eight. A couple things, right? So at the beginning, it says, and Saul saw what was happening and was pleased. So Saul, who becomes Paul, is really happy that all these Christians are dying. Uh, Philip, our main character today, he preaches in Samaria. Notice this fulfills the promise that Jesus says, right? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria uh, and to the ends of the earth. So Philip preaches in Samaria, and then that's where we hit this passage today. So if we can get uh, our passage up here. All right. Uh, so uh, I'll read from Acts chapter 8. Uh, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandaka, which means queen of the Ethiopians, this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus, and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Let me pray for us real quick. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your good word. We thank you for the message that was given to Philip uh, and the eunuch uh, that carries all the way to us today, um, the first Gentile believer. Uh, we thank you for the way your kingdom goes forth, the way you have a perfect plan, uh, the way you have a plan for us, and you desire to use us for your purposes. Uh, Holy Spirit, may we be sensitive to the ways you want to speak to us tonight. Uh, we thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, a little bit of quick background. A uh, little awkward, but some folks, there are some folks in this room who might not know what a eunuch is. All right. So a eunuch is, uh, in ancient royal cultures, in ancient royal cultures, uh, a eunuch is somebody who has been castrated. That means a male who has had his genitals removed. Uh, this is for the purpose of, in royal courts, uh, for, for lineage, uh, for lineage purposes, right, if there's a queen uh, and a king, you, want, you need to guarantee kind of royal lineage of their offspring. Uh, so the only people kind of allowed to be in close positions with a queen, uh, males, the only men allowed to work closely with, with queens uh, were eunuchs to ensure that they would not impregnate uh, these, these queens. Okay, so that's the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, can we get the map up there, actually? So a little bit of background. I wish I had a, a laser pointer here. Uh, if you see, uh, so there's Samaria there, right? And that's where Philip is. And then there's a road from Jerusalem, I'll point it out. Uh, so Jerusalem's right here to Gaza. All right, so there's that. Ooh, thank you, thank you. Wow, this, this is great. Yeah, that little map. You, you know, usually that mouse is like kind of, that's like really annoying, like when, when there's like a PowerPoint thing and the mouse is there, but like now it's like useful. So, okay. All right, so, so there's that, uh, and then Africa is, is like way down here. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Brandon. thanks, Brandon. Yeah, so Africa's like way down here. Uh, so we know, um, so there's a, there's a road from Jerusalem to Gaza, uh, and uh, Philip 
goes down and meets the eunuch like halfway there. Okay, so that's that's some geography there. In other words, they kind of just they, they just cross paths, right? They weren't they weren't going along the same path. They crossed paths. All right. So, but what we see in this passage is that through this awkward encounter, God shows that he desires to use uh, our background, our obedience, our faithfulness, and our wisdom with the work of the Holy Spirit to further his kingdom to the ends of the earth. All right, let me repeat that. Uh, God shows that he desires to use our background, our obedience, our faithfulness, and our wisdom with the work of the Holy Spirit to further his kingdom to the ends of the earth. All right, let's, talk w- let's start with the awkwardness here, okay? Um, real quick, real quick, let's play word associations. Uh, turn to the person next to you. Uh, turn to the person next to you, and just what comes to mind when you think about evangelism or sharing your faith? Okay, go. All right, let's bring it together. Let's bring it together. Uh, let me just hear. Let me just hear like three answers. All right, three answers from the crowd. Just three people. Just just shout out what you or your partner talked about. All right, go ahead. What WWJD? Okay. I mean, well, all right. What would Jesus do? All right, yeah, over there. J J W. What's? Oh yeah. Okay. Um. Also, let's not forget the Mormons. Let's not forget the Mormons. Okay. Yeah, over there. Sorry, Billy Graham. Billy Graham was a, was an evangelist. He was an evangelist. He just was. Okay. All right. Um. All right. Uh, all right. Maybe one more. One more. One more volunteer. Maybe from back there. Back there. Yeah. Living on mission. What do you mean by that? Okay. Yeah. 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 Living for others. Yeah, and then kind of being about something bigger than yourself, right? And that's that's important because I don't know about you, but uh, for me, uh, when it inv- when something involves doing something uncomfortable, uh, my question is going to be, what's in it for me? Right? My question is going to be, what's in it for me? Uh, and I won't do something uncomfortable unless there is something in it for me. Now, I think there's probably a full spectrum in this room. There's probably a full spectrum in this room in terms of feelings when it comes to evangelism, right? We heard about the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, I'm on I'm on staff at UW Madison, right? Uh, which a lot of people in Wisconsin might call Gomorrah. So uh, there are, <coughs> so actually quite routinely uh, on campus at the UW, there are these people who hold signs that say like th- these people and these people and these people are all going to hell, right? So uh, a lot of people, a lot of students who you know sincere followers of Jesus on campus at the UW Madison aren't really that interested in kind of going around campus and doing evangelism because, well, people are going to assume we're like those people, right? So, um, so there are there are people who don't want to seem uh, like that type of Christian, right? In this room, I'm sure there there are people here uh, who don't want to seem like that type. Of, do do the sign guys come here too? Oh, okay. Guess you guys are just as pagan as we are in Madison. So. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> so the sign guys, uh, so, so we don't want to look like the sign guys, right? Uh, then there are people, then there are folks in this room who are totally been there, done that. I'm a pro, right? I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but there's some people in this room who are like, the speaker tonight is speaking on evangelism. Ugh, I'm already so good at it. And I'm either like, I mean, some of those people probably aren't even here because they're like, why do they even need to hear somebody talk about it? Um, or some of you are, are, are in this audience thinking, well, I'm just going to tune out. So they actually, so those people are among you, but they don't actually hear the words coming out of my mouth because they're already tuned out, right? Um, because they've been there, done that. They already know what they're doing. Like, I share my faith all the time. Like, the, gu- the, d- the guy next to me in my dorm room, uh, I share my faith with him all the time. The person in the dorm room next to me hears me share my faith all the time, right? Uh, now, obviously, uh, I, I, I gave a little bit of, 
uh, of implied arrogance to that to said person. Now, said person among you might also just be a pro and just really genuinely love Jesus so much that, that they're just really good at sharing their faith and joy that Jesus Christ uh, brings them to. So I don't mean to belittle uh, that person among you, if you were that person. Um, now, and finally, finally, there's a group of people in here who, I mean, you follow Jesus, you know Jesus, right? Uh, your faith is very real to you, but, I mean, you're just terrified, right? You know, when it comes to sharing your faith, all right, so so there are friends in my life uh, who don't know Jesus, and, okay, one, if I share about my faith with them, like, what if they're not my friend anymore, right? I mean, it, 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 it like, it was, it was so hard to make, like, one friend, like, I don't want to lose this one friend, right? So, uh, <coughs> so there's that. Um, there's that. And then there's also just, uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm terrified of strangers, maybe because I paid attention in kindergarten, you know? <laughs> um, <coughs> so, <laughs> so, so I'm terrified of strangers, right? Strangers are bad. Don't talk to strangers, right? Uh, so I'm terrified of strangers, um, and I'm just as terrified of my friends, <laughs> right? I'm just as terrified of my friends, right? Because strangers will think all these things of me. Right, and I and they they'll I, you know I'll make Christians look bad, right? And then I'm just as terrified of my friends because if if I confront just a little bit, uh, in terms of talking about Jesus, uh, they also will think all these things about me, and they will drop me as a friend, right? So, uh, those are kind of the different groups here. Uh, but but look at how awkward this is, right? Um, I mean, one is just random. Um, they just run into each other. Philip is going south. The eunuch is going west. Uh, even though theoretically the eunuch should be going south to go home, and Philip just has no idea where he's going, right? He's just listening to the Holy Spirit, and they just bump into each other on this wilderness road, which is scary. You're actually not supposed to travel on wilderness roads at that time uh, because that's where bandits are, and, you know, you have to, like, bring a hacksaw and hack your way through the brush. Or, you know, I, I, I don't know what the foliage looks like out there, but it's scary, okay? So, um... So they just run in, into each other randomly, and then, hold on a minute, hold on a minute, okay. Philip is ethnically Jewish, speaks Greek as his native language. Uh, the Ethiopian is Ethiopian, right? I don't, I mean, I don't know if Philip has seen a black person before, but, you know, he's like, you know, he's like, he's like oh, you know, is he, gonna, is he gonna talk to him, <laughs> right? Okay, so um, that's one thing. All right, another, another, uh, there is socioeconomic status at play here. All right, so at this time in the ancient Near East, uh, if you were essentially like a normal person or if you were like middle class, you would kind of walk everywhere, right? Because you wouldn't be able to afford transportation uh, or besides your feet. Um, you know, maybe if you're like really middle class, you got like nice shoes on or something, um, right? So, um, and then the upper middle class would maybe ride a horse or a donkey. All right, the upper middle class would maybe ride a horse or a donkey. Um, and the ballers would have a chariot, okay? All right, so um, so this is Philip. He's, going, he's getting whisked by the Holy Spirit. He's getting whisked by the Holy Spirit in the middle of the desert or the wilderness or whatever, right? Um, and then he looks across, and there's a black man in a chariot, right? He's <laughs> like, what is this, right? Um, he should be shocked. He should be shocked, right? <laughs> Philip should be like, um, I'm not even sure if we speak the same language, right? So... Um, so he should be utterly shocked, and yet, and yet, what happens? What happens? Oh, let's let's get the passage up there. Um, what happens when Philip sees the eunuch? Uh, Philip. Uh, so the the spirit says, "Go to that chariot and stay near it." What? Okay. Um, and Philip runs up to the chariot, and here's the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Okay, he runs up to the chariot. So he doesn't. I mean. I don't know about you, but I would probably just stand there and gawk. Okay, first of all, this is a wilderness road that nobody's supposed to be on. Second of all, it's a black man in the ancient Near East. Third of all, it's a guy in a chariot, which, I mean, so think about, that's pretty much like a Lamborghini uh, or, or a Tesla. It's like a Tesla in today's terms. All right, so, so you see a Tesla. Um, you see somebody of, of an ethnicity or a race that you've never seen before. Right, you see somebody of a race or ethnicity you've never seen before in a Lamborghini um, in the middle of campus. Right, I mean, um, like, I would probably tweet about it or put something on Instagram, right? Um, but Philip, uh, but Philip just goes right up to, Philip runs up and is like, do you know what you're reading? <laughs> right? Wow, okay, he's obedient to the spirit. 
Okay, so he embraces that awkwardness. He's not afraid. He's not afraid of the awkwardness. He embraces it. Um, right, so they have differences of background, cultural and religious. Um, but, but hold on, hold on. Notice that uh, the author doesn't specifically mention language, but, uh, but this book, Acts, is written in Greek. Uh, and we assume, we assume they're speaking Greek to each other. Okay, so uh, the, the disciples, the 12 disciples appointed these seven leaders of the church uh, who were native Greek speakers. And we assume because the eunuch is kind of well-to-do and well-educated, right, he's, he works directly for the queen of his country. Uh, we, we kind of assume through the text uh, and also the fact that, uh, that the eunuch is reading, uh, the, the eunuch is reading a scroll of, uh, of the Old Testament in Greek, actually. Um, so we know that the eunuch uh, knows Greek. So they're actually able to converse with each other effortlessly. Um, kind of cool, right? So Acts chapter 6, uh, the Greek speakers become leaders in the church for the first time. And right away in Acts chapter 8, uh, that comes in handy uh, because Greek is the, nati- is, is the native tongue um, of Philip. And it's a language that the eunuch speaks. So they're able to share uh, the gospel and converse with each other. Okay, so their backgrounds... Uh, obedience. I talked about that, right? So he runs. Uh, Philip runs. Philip follows the Holy Spirit uh, wherever he's prompted. Uh, notice that the, uh, toward the end of this passage, the Holy Spirit just sends him somewhere else. Uh, the, the angel of the Lord says to Philip, go south. Um, Philip listens. All right, Philip listens. Uh, finally, faithfulness and wisdom. Right, so I'm talking about how God shows his desire to use our backgrounds, our obedience, our faithfulness and wisdom. Um, let's look at faithfulness and wisdom. All right, so verse 30, he runs up to the chariot. Um, but, but wait, look at what happens when he runs up to the chariot. Um, do you understand what you're reading? He talks. How can, I, how can I, the eunuch says, unless somebody explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So, so here's what happens, right? So Philip's like runs up to the chariot. He's like, boom, and he stops right there. And he's like, do you know what you're reading, right? I mean, I don't know, but, like, usually if you have a lot of momentum going, it's kind of it's hard to stop yourself, right? So he stops and waits until the eunuch invites him up. How many of you guys have seen the movie Hitch? Will Smith? All right, hands. Okay, what does is, what is Hitch, what does Hitch's Will Smith tell his trainee about when to go for a kiss and how to go for a kiss on a first date? There we go. You go 90, I go 10, right? So, so like, if if... If Hitch's client goes in 100% um, for the kiss on a first date, like that's at at best that's harassment, and at worst it's like w- right <laughs> it's worse than that, right? So, <laughs> um, whereas whereas if we have like if if he goes 90 and waits, which is exactly what Philip does right here, right? He goes 90 and he's like doesn't harass the guy, just waits right there outside of his chariot and waits for him to be invited in. He doesn't get in the chariot. Right, he doesn't invade his private space, right? 21st century North America, we are big on that space bubble, right? Do you guys like it when someone get, like gets up in your face and starts, right? No, not okay, right? So if somebody comes into your room without asking, no, not okay, right? So, <coughs> so he stays outside, uh, he stays outside the chariot until he's invited in, right? So we see that faithfulness and wisdom, but hold on, there's more, there's more. In verse 35, in verse 35, he begins speaking from the passage uh, that the eunuch is reading. He begins speaking and then, cu- uh, and then points it to Jesus. All right, if we can go to the next, no, the one after this. Yeah. Um, then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Right? He wasn't, he wasn't like, oh, you're watching this movie? Well, guess what? There's this Jesus guy. Right? <coughs> he has a transition. <laughs> right? There's, there's no awkward break in that conversation. In fact, I think this Philip guy is kind of smooth. Um, the other thing going on here is that in terms of this Bible passage, uh, so actually this isn't a direct quotation from Scripture uh, that's being read here. Uh, it's definitely from the book of Isaiah, um, but it's a little bit of a combination of chapter 49 and chapter 43. Uh, now, this, this isn't to say that Luke made a mistake. It's to say that Luke didn't want to quote all of chapters 49, 50, 51, 52, and 53. Uh, in this passage of scripture, right? So, <coughs> so this is kind of the highlights. This is the highlights of what the eunuch is reading. Now, there are two possibilities here in terms of Philip being able to speak from these scriptures to Jesus, right? Um, one is he's just really, really, really attentive to the Holy Spirit, 
And he's like, yes, Isaiah 53. That leads to Jesus because, like a sacrifice thing, you know. Uh, so he just listens to the Holy Spirit. The other possibility, the other possibility is that Philip just knows his Bible inside and out. Uh, and kind of with his passion for Jesus is just able to make that connection. Now, I think it's actually a little of both. I think it's a little of both. We've seen from this passage already that Philip is very attentive to the Holy Spirit and is very obedient. Um, but I think he knows this passage really well, too. And again, because of the ways Jesus has worked uh, through him and in him and on his heart, um, he's able to make that connection. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, faithfulness and wisdom. Uh, let's, let's go to, let's go to this slide. Uh, I have some questions up here, some reflection questions. Yeah. Nope. Yep. Are we able to, no? Okay, no questions. Okay. Uh, I have a couple questions then, uh, for you guys, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of, let me pull those up. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to give you guys some reflection questions and close with a story, but, um, here's some questions, right? So, so when it comes to sharing your faith, uh, I want you to think about, um, are you unafraid of the awkward, right? Are you unafraid of the awkward? That's for a second. Um, are you obedient and attentive to the Holy Spirit, right? Are you obedient and attentive to the Holy Spirit? Third, um, are you on the lookout for those who are already seeking Jesus, even those who you wouldn't expect? Um, notice the eunuch is already pursuing Jesus, right? We know uh, from this passage, so the eunuch went to Jerusalem and wanted to worship, um, probably um, due to a combination of ethnic and uh, physiological factors. In other words, his being castrated uh, meant that because he had uh, a physical deformity, um, as was defined by Jewish law, he wasn't allowed into the temple to worship. Um, so he wasn't allowed to worship, but he really wanted to know about the Jewish faith. And then Philip is like, oh, well, there's this guy named Jesus who fulfills everything you're reading. Um, but the eunuch was already seeking Jesus. Right, so there are friends in our lives who want to get as far from God as possible, um, but there are also people in our lives who really, really uh, are seeking and pursuing Jesus, uh, and they might even be pursuing Jesus in ways that we don't see and that we kind of are too narrow-minded to notice, right? Um, whether it's that really activisty person, um, whether it's that pr that's that person who's really into movies, whether it's that person who's hurting um, and running away. Um, whether it's that person who's lonely, there, there are different ways that people are looking for Jesus, um, but we need to see that and find that and start with the ways they're looking for Jesus rather than wanting other people uh, to follow the same path that we followed in terms of getting to know Jesus, right? Does that make sense? Like, we think other people should follow, uh, should get to know Jesus exactly the same way we did, um, whereas actually different people are already searching for Jesus in their own ways, all right? Uh, and finally, are you growing in faithfulness and wisdom and awareness of how God can use you and your gifts, right? So Philip, because Greek was his native language, because he was obedient to the Holy Spirit, because, because he was unafraid of that awkward, situa of that awkward situation, was used by God um, really to share his good news. This is the first non-Jewish believer um, in the Bible, uh, really kind of in the way that... Uh, people spoke in the ancient Near East. Ethiopia was literally the end of the earth. Um, and God's kingdom goes forth uh, because of Philip's obedience, because of Philip's faithfulness, because of Philip's willingness to embrace that awkwardness, uh, that he doesn't think it's weird to just run up to a chariot and be like, oh, what are you reading, <laughs> right? Um, he's not afraid of that. Um, now, we also, I think uh, most of us in this room fall in different places in a spectrum in terms of how we feel about sharing our faith randomly. Uh, I want to say a couple things to that. Uh, one, I actually do think that God primarily calls us uh, to share our faith with those um, who are already in our lives, right? So I think we're primarily called uh, to share our faith with those who are already in our lives, but uh, and especially those who are most like us. That's why Jesus told them that they would be his witnesses in, Jerus in Jerusalem and Judea. But he also said Samaria to the ends of the earth, right? So I think we're also called to share our faith with those who are most different from us, uh, and also uh, to share our faith in unexpected ways. In unexpected ways, including proxy stations, including conversational evangelism, including with strangers, including somebody sitting next to us on the bus. Right? We never know. We have to be listening to the Holy Spirit. Um, so I wanted to share about a time in my life when I actually was able to share my faith randomly. Now, it wasn't completely random. Uh, so a, a friend of mine on staff with InterVarsity uh, had been doing conversational evangelism in Madison. 
uh, and met a guy uh, who was uh, who seemed really interested, um, but they just weren't able to finish the conversation because they both had to be somewhere. Um, but this staff friend uh, got the guy's contact info uh, and kind of texted me and was like, "Hey, can you follow up with this guy?" I was like, uh, "Sure." So I followed up, or I followed up, and uh, it was kind of like a blind date. You know, I was like, "I'll be at the union at five. Uh, I have an orange backpack. You know, <laughs> I'm Asian. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so uh, so it was like a blind date. Uh, so I meet this guy. A uh, couple couple details about him. Uh, one is it was during the summer. Uh, turned out that he was a summer student. Uh, he was a summer student at the UW Madison. Uh, his his the school he was enrolled at was actually Columbia University in New York. Uh, he was a summer student U at the UW Madison because Madison has like these really random, small, obscure programs that are really good. So uh, it was like ancient Thai, like that he was studying or so like like that or like. Yeah, some <laughs> anyway, some really obscure language. Apparently, there's like a really good program at Madison for it. So, uh, so he was studying this, uh, and uh, I, I met with him, and then we started chatting. And it turned out that that a local mega church in Madison, um, actually that I don't attend, um, but I knew that a local mega church had a service in about an hour at 6 p.m. I was like, hey, do you want to go with me? And he's like, okay, cool. Uh, so, so he was cool with that. So I just took him. You know, um, he got in my car, which is kind of strange. You know. But whatever. Okay. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, so he gets in my car. We, we go to this church. Uh, and as we're driving over there, um, as we're driving over there, he actually starts kind of pouring out his heart and just sharing about different areas of brokenness in his life with me. And I was like, oh, wow, this is crazy, man. This guy was just waiting for somebody to talk to about this stuff. And I was like, I think God, I think God has some plans here for this conversation. Um, during the service, uh, again, I've been to this church like three times in my entire life. Um, but somehow the sermon actually really, really touched on a lot of those areas of brokenness that he'd been sharing with me about. Uh, so I was like, okay, cool. And after the service, after the service, I, I got, you know, I, I got really brave. I got really brave, and I, I walked right up to him, and I said, Josh, do you like pie? Um, <coughs> and he said, he said, I love pie. I was like, that's great. I love pie, too, you know? So, <coughs> you know, win. All right, so uh, so any any folks uh, kind of like west side of Madison, Middle Middleton area. Uh, so we went to Hubbard Avenue Diner. Uh, anybody? Delicious pie, really really delicious pie. All right, um, I had uh, I had a banana cream. He had a French silk. All right, so <clears throat> so we go there when you, when we order pie, we order pie, uh, and we start talking, um, and I'm you know I'm kind of like Josh, you know. Uh, uh, I actually happen to have, uh, I have about four or five of those gig Bible studies, right? Uh, a Bible study to do uh, with a Christ with a believer and a non-believer. I have about four or five of those gig Bible studies kind of just in my head, uh, just ready to go. Uh, so I'm like, hey, do you want to just read a passage of scripture and talk about it together? Um, he's like, sure. So, uh, so I think, you know, I pray and I feel very called uh, to, uh, to read about the sinful woman, right, who anoints Jesus' feet with oil. Uh, so we read that passage of scripture together uh, on our phones, because we can do that now, right? So uh, so we read that passage of scripture together on our phones, um, and then it's, I mean, I can see he's getting hit really hard. Um, he's getting hit really hard with Jesus' with Jesus's message of grace and unconditional love, um, especially amidst brokenness. Uh, and, and he looks at me, and he says, uh, I ask him a discussion question. I don't remember, you know, like, what do you think the interplay between verse five and six and the jar is? You know, um, I ask him some <coughs> some question like that, uh, and he says, "You know, Calvin, I didn't really hear your question, um, but I feel like it's kind of weird for me to be studying this passage of scripture with you and talking without making any sort of commitment." I'm like, "Oh, okay." Um, so I tell him, I was like, you know, I don't know. You know, when you follow Jesus, it means that you want to do this and this and this. And, you know, you believe that Jesus died for your sins, that his grace is real, and that you accept him, and that you actually desire to follow him in your life and give up everything for the kingdom of God, which is this and this and this. He's like, yeah, I know. I, I want that. And I'm like, no, 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 but you don't, you don't get it. So, like, <coughs> when following Jesus means all of these things, and I don't think you really want that. He's like, no, 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 I really want it. I was like, no, 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 I mean, I, I literally went a third time. I was like, no, but, you know, following Jesus involves all of these things. He's like, no, Calvin, I really, I really want to follow Jesus. I was like, well, if you, I, I mean, I, okay, like, if you really want to, 
if you really want to, it means these things. And I mean, just praying this now doesn't necessarily uh, symbol. It doesn't directly mean that. But if you pray, to, if you pray this and you really mean it and follow Jesus, then that um, that is following Jesus and receiving uh, His grace. And he's like, "Yeah, I want to do that." I was like, "Okay, let's do this." All right. Uh, so uh, so he prays. <laughs> he accepts Jesus. He decides to follow Jesus. All right. Um, I drive him back to campus in my car that he got into. Right. Um, <coughs> so I drive him back to campus. Um, now, turns out, turns out, here's what's happening, all right? Turns out he's actually leaving uh, the next day. He's going back to New York to start school, because um, this is about August already. So he's going back to New York to start school. I was like, oh, dang, you know? Um, now, this is, uh, Facebook is, like, just getting popular, because this is about, like, eh, this is, like, six years ago. So most people are on Facebook by now. Uh, so we friend each other on Facebook. All right, we friend each other on Facebook, uh, and then he emails me. Uh, we still exchange emails, because... We weren't quite at that generation where people like would just Facebook message each, each other. You know, you'd still have to do the email because if you if you only Facebook message each other, that's really weird. So uh, so we email each other. Um, so we email each other, and then he's like, "Hey, Calvin, I really want to find out ways that I can grow in my faith." I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, you should uh, get connected to a local church. You know, join some sort of a Bible study or accountability group, uh, some sort of group of witness. Um, and actually, while we're at it, I think you should. Uh, you know, when you get around to it, read these three books." Um, really to develop your faith and solidify um, what you believe and things like that. Uh, a week and a half later, he, he emails me again. He's like, hey, Calvin, so I started going to this church and joined a small group, and I read all three of those books, so what else do you have? <laughs> um, <coughs> I was like, what? You know, uh, so so no joke, right? Uh, so I, I, I list four more books for him. I list four more books, but I was like, and, but I said, actually, this is the last email I think you're going to get from me in terms of that stuff. I'd love to hear about how you're doing faith-wise, but you should be receiving this uh, from your local church community. He's like, cool, all right, yeah, I'll ask Pastor So-and-so, who I chatted with after service last week. I was like, okay, that's cool. Um, so we actually haven't dialogued that much since then, uh, but I do follow his blog. Uh, he blogs, um, and I wanted to put up something that he posted on his blog about a month after that encounter. Um, we got a, got a picture here. There we go. All right, so this is, uh, this is something that he posted. All right, so he wrote, this is why I call myself a follower of Christ and follow no one else. Christianity is not about putting on airs of holiness, but neither is it about living a life without shame. Christianity is not about tithing, paying taxes to Caesar, or voting for one political party and not the other. Christianity is not about being Georgian Orthodox or progressive Protestant, but Christianity is about loving one's neighbor as one loves themselves, even if that neighbor is Armenian, a Russian Jew, or a Turkish Muslim. Christianity is about following the example of the Good Samaritan, regardless of one's station in life, regardless of who the broken, bleeding man on the sidewalk is, nor what crimes he may have committed in the past. Christianity is about healing the sick and comforting the dying. Christianity is about self-sacrifice and seeing beyond the mere appearances of our mortal flesh. Christianity is about brotherhood and sisterhood. True Christianity is about caring, love, and forgiveness. Um, this is a guy who had accepted Jesus a month and a half before he wrote this, a month and a half before he wrote this, in a completely random encounter in a strange dude's car, you know, like um, at a at a diner that had really good pie, um, after going to a church building, after not having stepped into a church in more than in more than fifteen years. But this is real faith. This is real faith because, um, and you know why. <laughs> Um, it wasn't because of my words. Uh, if anything, it was despite my words, right? Uh, it was because of the work of the Holy Spirit and because he was hungry. He wanted to know Jesus. There are people like that around us. There are people like that around us. Okay, can we, uh, let's throw the questions back up there. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me give you guys about just one or two minutes just to reflect on these questions. Uh, just to reflect on these questions and just even think about who the people are in your life or the ways God wants you to share your faith or maybe just what is keeping you uh, from hearing the Holy Spirit, um, what is keeping you from sharing your faith. I'm going to just give you guys maybe about two minutes to look over this and then I'll close this in prayer, okay?